Today we're going to be talking about a mom who fatally shot her nine and six year old sons. But is it mental disability or drugs that are to blame? We're going to follow that with when the predator's victim kills, where a 16 year old is repeatedly found in the company of their 23 year old predator until a four year old ends up not alive anymore. And the psychotherapist, a psychology PhD candidate, flies across the country to kill a newborn. Is jealousy the true culprit? Last at bat is Nurse G Reaper, where a woman completes years of schooling and training so she can kill premature babies. But why? I'll be telling the stories puffing on my vape and drinking some chocolate peppermint tea. It's peppermint tea with a splash of chocolate milk in it. If you're going to do it at home, make sure the milk is really fresh or the peppermint will curdle it. You just settle in with whatever types of comfort items you surround yourself with for true crime. Because this is when four women kill children on murder after dark. We'll start off with Mommy Got a Gun right after this overly obnoxious trigger warning. Roll the intro. It's 11.07 a.m. November 8th, 2023 in Shepherdsville, Kentucky. 911 receives a call. Someone reports hearing shots fired inside a home, the mother then running out of the house, frantically yelling, Call an ambulance! I just shot them! Police arrive at the 200 block of Brentwood to find Tiffany Lucas curled up on the front lawn. Officers rush inside to find 9-year-old Maurice and 6-year-old Jaden, or Peanut as the family calls him on the same bed as the gun that shot them. Tiffany is taken into custody on the scene. But how did we get here? If we go back to 2016, we will find Miss Tiff's one-stop shop, a recently opened convenience store owned by Tiffany Lucas, the proud entrepreneur and mother of two young boys. She's doing some local community activism for female entrepreneurship. Pictures from the time show Tiffany, Maurice, and Jaden being the happy family. The store was a speculative venture based on Walmart's plans to open a store nearby. It was a pretty low traffic part of town and simply could not support the convenience store. At least not until Walmart brought in all those shoppers. Then, Walmart decided not to put a store there. In 2017, Miss Tiff's one-stop shop was shuttered. In 2018, Tiffany pleaded guilty to drug charges and served 30 days in jail. It appears that between this time and November 8, 2023, Tiffany kept her nose clean. However, Durrell, who has the same father as Maurice and Jaden and is much older than the two, claims that the family has called CPS about Tiffany several times since 2019. That's when the three boys' father died, and Durrell became much more active in Maurice and Jaden's lives, attempting to fill in some of the hole their father's death left. Badass. Durrell had last seen his brothers just days prior to the shootings. He reports we just played a card game. Just a card game. It was as simple as that. And we had the best time. The best time ever. Durrell also stated, We wanted them. We would have taken them with open arms. We loved them so much. Durrell continued to lament, Should have did more. If it came to me snatching the boys out of the house, I should have. And I will hold that on my back for the rest of my life, for both them boys. On the morning of November 8, 2023, a neighbor hears four gunshots in 30 seconds from inside Tiffany's home. Then sees Tiffany run out the front door yelling, Call an ambulance! I just shot them! The neighbor runs into the house and sees Maurice and Jaden lying on the bed. They'd been shot. He runs back out and calls 911. The ambulance arrives before the boys die, but Maurice and Jaden do pass shortly after arriving at the hospital. They're loved. 
missed and gone too soon. Rest in peace, and as your brother Darrell pointed out, enjoy your time with your dad. Tiffany is taken into custody at the scene. Family members cleaned out Tiffany's home after it was cleared by police. They were shocked at the filth inside. They had no idea about the eviction notice laying on the counter. And it was difficult to clean without the utilities being turned on, too. I'm bewildered, sir, but I'm certainly not afraid. Friends of Tiffany's could not believe what happened. Talia, a family friend, spent Halloween with Maurice, Jaden, and Tiffany. She reports that everything was good then. Talia states, we were literally just together and everything was good. She does also report that Tiffany goes off very fast. Very fast. During police interviews, Tiffany did not deny shooting Maurice and Jaden. She claimed that it was an accident. Tiffany told police she was in such a bad spot, probably referring to what the family would find inside the home. Tiffany is quoted as saying, I would never do anything like this unless someone manipulated me. Maurice and Jaden's stepmother, Michelle, has a different opinion. She states, it's drugs. So many other people really love them and could have been there to help them, but Tiffany wouldn't allow that. She was too selfish and now they're gone. Tiffany is currently in the Bullitt County Jail in Leo of $2 million bond. Mediation has been ordered in the case to see if a plea bargain can be reached. Seeing the family's reaction to the order, don't think that is going to happen. Now let me tell you about when the predator's victim kills. I knew he must have been about 17. On June 14, 2024, Destiny Rhodes' roommate called 911 and reported that Destiny's daughter Octavia was unresponsive and beyond help. Arriving at the scene, first responders confirmed the truth of the 911 caller's statement. Octavia is rushed to the hospital. Destiny is taken into custody. The juvenile male at the scene is not questioned as he is a minor. But how did we get here? Before I get started here, I do have to thank Channel 14 News from the Fort Wayne area for making all these wonderful pictures of Sweet Olivia available. We will also be discussing two cities, so a little geographic primer might be helpful. Evansville is about 300 miles south and slightly west of Fort Wayne. Both are in Indiana. It's pretty much a straight roll down 65, and it's a fucking boring drive. The perfect place to listen to a show like this one. Now, on to the story. The story starts back in February of 2024, when 15-year-old Christian Gonzalez was reported missing from his grandmother's home in Evansville. Christian already has multiple offenses in his criminal jacket, which to me only means he should have been removed from his environment and placed into a psychiatric care facility years ago. Fuck the entire juvenile justice system. This child is prime material for a predatory person. Enter Destiny Rhodes. She and four-year-old Octavia's father had split up. Not certain if they were married or not. Octavia's father, who I'm not naming for privacy reasons, was her primary custodian, but Destiny had overnight visitation rights. Let me repeat that. Octavia's father was her primary custodian. Destiny, displaying symptoms of severe codependency issues and possibly anxiety-based mental disorders, starts reaching out to any man that will talk to her online. She encounters the troubled 15-year-old Christian. The two start an online relationship, then Christian runs away from his home in Evansville and is reported missing by his grandmother. The investigation turns up internet communications between Christian and Destiny, and he is located at her home in Fort Wayne. Christian was placed in Hillcrest Youth Home, which he immediately ran away from. He was quickly located back at Destiny's house, at which time they placed Christian in the Youth Care Center. Equality, non-secure, short-term emergency shelter care, according to their website. But later sources indicate Christian was booked into this facility. Destiny was charged with contributing to the delinquency of a minor and a court date of April 11th was set. Destiny returned to Fort Wayne in the meantime. Christian went missing again while Destiny was in town for the court date. He was still listed as missing June 13th. The police had checked Destiny's residence for the youth multiple times. Somehow he managed to avoid detection every time. Christian had turned 16 since February. Doesn't really change anything, just thought you should know his age changed. 
Christian's missing status will change June 14th. Before this story takes a serious turn into Darkville, mind if I ask you to go ahead and click that thumbs up since you've already made it through one and a half stories today? Sorry about the interruption, now back to poor little Octavia's story. If you remember from the introduction to this story, that is when a 911 call was placed about Octavia. Emergency personnel, including fire, EMS, and police, arrive at the apartment on the 4500 block of Spring Valley Road, Evansville, Indiana. They find three adult females who have not been publicly named by police. The 16-year-old Christian and the unresponsive and cold to the touch but still breathing 4-year-old Octavia. They learn Destiny is at work, but she arrives shortly, having left work after learning the police were at her residence. The adults are taken to the police station and questioned. The press release this came from does not indicate where Christian was taken, only that he was not questioned as he is a minor. As a result of this questioning, Christian and Destiny are taken into custody on charges related to the child abuse. Destiny also has charges related to Christian. Other three adult females who have repeatedly witnessed Destiny abusing a teenage boy for months were let go. Some very disturbing details came out of these interviews. On the evening of June 12, the roommate reports noticing bruises around Octavia's neck and a bite mark on her arm. On the evening of June 13, the roommate, I do not know if it's the same one or not, reports Octavia staring off into space, being nauseous and not responding properly. Though not interviewed that night, Christian did eventually admit to leaving the bite mark on Octavia's arm. He says it's because she bit him first, asshole. For some reason, the roommates are still let go, even though they failed to report. In my opinion, every adult who takes up residence in a home with a minor should be considered a mandatory reporter, but that's besides the point. On Sunday, June 15th, Octavia succumbs to her injuries. The charges against Destiny and Christian are amended. Christian is now facing murder charges as an adult. Destiny is being charged with neglect of a dependent resulting in death, a charge nearly equivocal to murder. Can I ask you a question before we leave this tale? If Christian, Destiny, and the roommate's genders were reversed, would this be the same story? If a 16-year-old female had repeatedly run away into the arms of a 23-year-old male predator with the assistance of his three adult male roommates and eventually did the same things Christian did, would the rest of the story stay the same? Were you a little shocked when the story revealed Christian's gender? Just think about that for a minute while I get ready to tell you about the psychotherapist. It is Savannah and Ethan's one year anniversary. Tomorrow is Ethan's first Father's Day as a dad. The two are at UPMC, Pittsburgh Medical Center Children's Hospital, with their six and a half week old son, who appears to have injuries to his genitals and face. An ambulance brings Leon, Savannah and Ethan's other son, the injured baby's twin, in with severe head injuries. Just over five and a half hours into Ethan's first Father's Day, six and a half week old Leon succumbs to his injuries. I bet you want to know how we got here. Savannah and Nicole Verzi have been friends since childhood. They're currently both fifth year doctoral candidates in clinical psychology with the same specialization. Savannah studies at Pittsburgh University while Nicole studies at the University of California, San Diego. Both women reside in the cities their universities are in, but they both grew up in the Northeast together. While Nicole and Savannah have been besties for years, other high school friends report Nicole is having social issues. An observation I find very interesting. Nicole has published 11 academic papers as the lead author, which is pretty impressive for a fifth year PhD candidate. Largely, these papers focus on eating disorders and their ties to stress and depression. I've heard some true crime reporters hinting at Nicole being jealous of Savannah, little Leon's mother, as a motive. So let's compare the two as a sort of litmus test for this hypothesis. Nicole obtained BAs in psychology and English, both summa cum laude, from Pepperdine University. While Savannah obtained a BS in psychology, which is more difficult to obtain than a BA, and a BA in Spanish from Western Washington University, both magna cum laude which is less impressive than summa cum laude. While both universities are on the west coast, they are 1,200 miles apart, and I'm calling it a tie on the one-upmanship at this point. Nicole obtained an MS in clinical psychology from San Diego State University. 
In 2022, Savannah received her MA in Clinical Science from the University of Delaware. She's been a PhD candidate at the University of Pittsburgh since 2019 and expects to graduate in 2027. I think it is safe to say that we will all understand if she pushes this back a semester or two. Savannah has published 39 papers, with six more presently in the pipeline. You can see how Nicole might be jealous of these papers. Savannah has a very well-designed website, which is one of the top hits when you Google her name. Whereas Nicole has no such web presence that I can find, I can see a little more jealousy building here. I can find no information about if Nicole has a partner, which I think makes it safe to assume she does not. Savannah is married and starting a family. Yeah, I can see that causing jealousy. Before I wrap this part up, what do you think about jealousy as Nicole's motive? Leave a comment. Let me know. For all of that, I think it's possible that jealousy could be a motive. I'm not convinced, but it's possible. I'm not convinced because of the amount of work that went into committing these crimes. I would either need some kind of weird love triangle or evidence of Nicole having trouble starting a family to really buy into that. But it is possible. Although, the only alternative motive I have is heat of the moment, which is supported by the way Nicole's lawyers are talking about the case. Our client was uh, thrust quickly into a role of having to babysit a small child and an accident occurred and that child died. And unfortunately, accidents do happen. And it's a sad thing, it's an awful thing, but it doesn't mean that someone's culpable. So let's look at the actual case now. Nicole had just gotten into town earlier that day or the night before and checked into an Airbnb about a mile and a half from little Leon's home. She was only planning on being in town for the weekend. Personally, I would only travel this kind of distance for that short of a period of time if there was an event planned. But that's just me. Then Nicole went over to Savannah and Ethan's house. The couple left Leon and his brother in Nicole's care while they went out for an anniversary dinner. When you have a six and a half week old child, it is exceedingly difficult to get any time away, let alone when you have twins that age. Ethan and Savannah are enjoying their dinner alone. They have absolutely no worries with their children in the competent care of Savannah's longtime friend, Nicole. And Savannah's phone rings. It's Nicole's number. Savannah answers, expecting it to be something silly like, where are the extra bottle liners? Instead, Savannah reports that she was changing Leon's brother when she noticed bruising and swelling on his genitals. Savannah and Ethan rush home and immediately take little Leon's brother to UPMC Pittsburgh Medical Center Children's Hospital while leaving Leon with Nicole. Just hours later, with Father's Day quickly approaching, Savannah and Ethan learn that Leon's brother has four scratches on his face, two bruises on his belly button, redness and scratches on his penis. The doctors state that these injuries are serious and do not appear accidental in nature. Nicole calls 911 at 11.15 p.m. and reports that Leon fell from his bassinet while she was getting a bottle and is becoming unresponsive. At the hospital, they immediately begin treating Leon. They find a fractured skull. Post-mortem CTI scans find several brain bleeds. According to the Cleveland Clinic website, brain bleeds are also known as intracranial hemorrhages. They're a type of stroke that causes blood to pool between the brain and the skull, which prevents oxygen from reaching the brain. According to the information available about baby Leon, I do not know if they were internal, which means inside the brain, or external, which means between the brain and the skull on the outside of the brain, brain bleeds. According to New York Presbyterian Hospital, there are seven causes for brain bleeds, but only one is unnatural. The unnatural cause is head trauma, which is also the most common cause for people under 50 years old, which Leon six and a half weeks certainly is. It can be hard to imagine just how small and delicate a six week old baby is. An average six-week-old baby weighs 10.8 pounds. If you pick up a gallon of milk and a quart of half and half, that's 10.4 pounds. An average six-week-old baby is 21.5 to 23 inches or 54.7 to 58.4 centimeters. As a reference for that, just think about the size of the TV in your living room. An infant the age of Leon is still not able to support their own head and their skull still contains a soft spot as the bones are not completely developed yet. Leon is pronounced dead from his injuries at 5.47 a.m. on Ethan's first Father's Day. As Nicole was in the care of both children when the injuries occurred, she is questioned and asked to provide a reasonable explanation for the injuries. 
Nicole claims that Leon's brother was simply found that way and sticks to the bassinet story for Leon. Her new mailing address is the Allegheny County Jail near Pittsburgh where she is being held without bond until the trial. Nicole is innocent until proven guilty, but I wouldn't put my money on exoneration here. Have you noticed that the victims are getting younger? Have you noticed the stories are getting crazier? Why don't you go ahead and click the thumbs up while I tell you about Nurse G. Reaper. Picture this. You're sitting at your desk on Tuesday, July 3rd, 2018, pondering how cool it would be if you were in the U.S. and had off tomorrow instead of in the U.K. where you have to work. All of a sudden, the police come into the office and arrest the nurse working next to you in the risk and patient safety office. You can barely pretend not to listen as they read off eight murder and six attempted murder charges, all for babies in the neonatal ward where Nurse Lucy used to work. Where the fuck are we and how did we get here? I'm going to be very open and honest with you before I start this story. Nurse Lucy was actually arrested at home, but my version is cooler. More importantly, when I see a woman who goes through all of the schooling and training required to become a certified intensive neonatal nurse just so that she can kill premature babies, not only looking at a lady who is a couple sandwiches short of a picnic, but those sandwiches were eaten when she was a child. The path I take through this story is not intended to exculpate Lucy in any way. If you're an adult and you pull bullshit, you serve the time. Only exculpatory reasons are relevant, medical defects of this type are not, and neither is childhood trauma. And I'm not here to discuss should-bes with legal issues. Take this path so that we can learn how we might prevent future nurse Lucy's. Now, let's hear the story. On July 4th, 1990, in Hereford, England, 44-year-old John and 29-year-old Susan come into the maternity ward in labor. Yeah, he's 15 years older. No judgment. Okay, maybe a little bit of judgment. Anyway, moving on. They give birth to their only child, Lucy. Dawn, a friend of Lucy's, reports Lucy saying her birth was difficult and she was quite poorly. I'm not sure exactly what that means and further details are not available. But if she's telling this to friends as a teenager, I would agree with Dawn's assessment that it affected a lot of Lucy's life. Remember this. Dawn said Lucy feels called to help children born under similar circumstances. It is reported that Susan and John absolutely doted on Lucy. Remember this too. John and Susan were very proud and equally protective of Lucy. Was it to the point that Lucy was a child protected from the normal bumps and bruises, emotional and physical, a child feels growing up? Dawn stated, Lucy and I were the nerdy ones that concentrated on our studies, which is evidenced by the fact that Nurse Lucy obtained a BSc in child nursing from the University of Chester in 2011. The first college graduate in the family, and before she was even 21 years of age, the parents who took out an ad in the paper to announce Lucy's graduation were heartbroken shortly thereafter when she moved 100 miles away to start a job at the Countess of Chester Hospital. I'm from the northeastern United States, where we will drive 100 miles each way to get to work. But this is England. 100 miles is all the way across the country. In Pennsylvania, it doesn't even get you from Philly to Pittsburgh. But perspective is important. And to Nurse Lucy's parents, this is across the country. They were absolutely heartbroken, but they still helped purchase a 179,000 pound home for Lucy and her two cats, Tigger and Smudge. Nurse Lucy experiences undue guilt from the move. Nurse Lucy is not a new face around Countess of Chester Hospital. She did student nursing duties as an undergrad. By the time she had been on staff for two years, Nurse Lucy was completing training as an intensive care neonatal nurse. Lucy had already completed a placement at Liverpool Women's Hospital. She had appeared in a local newspaper, The Standard, several times as part of the Baby Grow Appeal. It was a campaign the hospital was running to fund a new, bigger neonatal unit, and she was only 22. By 2015, Nurse Lucy was 25 and qualified as an intensive neonatal nurse. The hospital changed her placement to reflect her upgraded credentials. Nurse Lucy is reported to have said that non-intensive nursing was boring. 
In the first month that Lucy had this appointment, as many babies crashed and died on the ward in that month, as had in all of 2014, the doctor started calling for Lucy's removal from the rolls with direct patient contact. The hospital told the doctors not to stir up a fuss over nothing. At some point, Lucy was moved from night to day rotations. Coincidentally, the nighttime crashes returned to normal, but the daytime crashes increased. These deaths included two of three triplets on consecutive days, followed by another baby the following day, all on Nurse Lucy's watch. Remember this. Also, immediately upon returning to work from a regular vacation with her parents, at which point the doctors wanted the police involved. The trust that ran the hospital did not think they could financially withstand the bad press the police would bring. They hired a third party to conduct the investigation. The third party recommended Lucy be removed from all patient contact during the investigation, and so the hospital did. Nurse Lucy then filed a grievance at being reassigned before guilt was proven. So she was put back on duty and the trust that ran the hospital was forced to publicly apologize. How much and what flavor pie do you think the union has on their face right now? Let me know in a comment. Nurse Lucy was scheduled to return to her duties in intensive neonatal care in March. Instead, the hospital decided they had no choice but to involve the police. The victims' names were withheld by the UK courts for good and understandable reasons. Instead, they are referred to as Child A through Child Q. Peppermint chocolate tea. Nurse Lucy was the only person present for all the crashes. Preliminary autopsies did not find the means Nurse Lucy had used because she's like a nurse and shit. They went back and did further testing as part of the police investigation and found some babies injected with insulin, others overfed, among other methods not detectable in a normal infant autopsy. Because who the fuck does those things to an infant in a neonatal ward? Nurse Lucy. That's who. That's who does that shit. Sorry, back to the story. Police discover a horde of post-it notes that look very similar to the one on your screen. Matter of fact, this is one of them. Might I bring your attention to the bottom where it says, I am evil. I did this. There is another one where she's saying she didn't know if she did it. Find this very concerning. Let me take a moment to lay some psychobabble on you. Disconnection of thoughts, memories, feelings, surroundings, behavior, and identity characterize disassociative disorders. The symptoms are lengthy and include memory loss for periods of time, suicidal thoughts, separation from emotions, and not being able to cope with stress. The three disassociative disorders are depersonalization, derealization, feeling like you're outside yourself and the world isn't real, respectively. Disassociative amnesia, inexplicable memory loss, could be specific events, time periods, people, just about anything that is inexplicable and Disassociative Identity Disorder, formerly known as Multiple Personality Disorder. It is notable at this point that none of these disorders is a valid legal insanity plea, though they can go towards competence to stand trial. Okay, so let's get back to Nurse Lucy so I can explain why I told you all of this. Those two post-it notes showing an evolution from maybe I did it to I did this shows a mental progression. Have you ever been blackout drunk in your youth and had the memories slowly come back over time? Well, that can happen with disassociative amnesia and disassociative identity disorder. And that's kind of what I see in these two notes. Reporters noted that one of the two times when Nurse Lucy showed emotion at the trial was when discussing her own suicidal thoughts. Remember, two of the symptoms are suicidal thoughts and being disconnected from your emotions. This woman sat there stone-faced and listened to people describe the horrible death suffered by premature infants because of what she did. If that's not disconnection from emotions, I don't know what is. Here's a picture of Nurse Lucy's 2016 diary. Does that look like a journal a normal 26-year-old woman would use? Additionally, she kept teddy bears on her bed. Now look, I'm not passing judgment. If you've got teddy bears on your bed, that's cool. But keep this in context of what I've already pointed out about Nurse Lucy's mental state. People tend to revert to a childlike state when they become overly stressed. How often does a dude start playing video games after a 20-year hiatus and during his divorce? 
How often does a woman take up a high school hobby again in the same situation? Ever eat your favorite childhood lunch because you were having a bad day? It's normal. But in this context, it demonstrates she's having trouble with the stress of life. Also, three times a year, John, Susan, and Lucy, remember her parents, vacation in Torquay. I hope I said that right. Right up until Nurse Lucy gets arrested. Remember that undue guilt over the move? I'm guessing it was worse after these trips. Also, immediately upon returning to work from a regular vacation with her parents. Remember how I hinted at her parents being overbearing? John and Susan were very proud and equally protective of Lucy. When Nurse Lucy got arrested, Susan was there yelling, I did it! Take me! Yeah, this woman never protected Lucy from the consequences of her actions, did she? On top of that, studies indicate that men who marry much younger women score significantly higher on the controlling aspects of their personalities. And John is 15 years older than Susan. For perspective, I'm only 16 years older than Nurse Lucy. Hey, baby. How you doing? So why did Nurse Lucy do it? Well... She's fucking crazy. Have you been paying any attention at all? But more specifically, I think it is possible that Lucy developed a form of disassociative amnesia in childhood or her teen years as a trauma response to an overbearing household where she felt like every aspect of her life was controlled. The amnesia would allow Lucy to act out and then continue normal life because she simply did not remember the awful things she did. Now remember when I said this? Dawn, a friend of Lucy's, reports Lucy saying her birth was difficult and she was quite poorly. I think Lucy felt it would have been better if she didn't survive that difficult birth. As if that birth was somehow responsible for the fact that she felt like a burden to her parents. And I think Lucy thinks she was helping those babies avoid her life. Dawn said Lucy feels called to help children born under similar circumstances. Yes, I know it's fucking crazy. I said that a little less than a minute ago. But it's what I think her motive was. We will never know, though, because John, Susan, Dawn, and Lucy all still maintain Lucy's innocence. Lucy is serving the UK equivalent of life without. As she should be. But how can we stop this shit from happening? What do you think? Are these some crazy ass murders or what? Tell me about it in the comments while you listen to something. All the victims in today's stories are gone too soon and taken too violently to their families, friends, and loved ones. I'm sorry for your loss. The reason I tell these stories is so I can tell you my idea for how to prevent them in the future. You need to make quarterly medical checkups compulsory from everyone from 0 to 36 months of age. We need to make staggered semi-annual medical and psychological checkups compulsory from everyone from 3 to 18 years of age. Pulsory means that if an appointment is missed completely, the parental rights are removed from all legal guardians of the child immediately, permanently, and irrevocably. End of story. You can use religion as an excuse for child neglect when we let Mormons practice polygamy. After all, their scriptures out and out say they're supposed to in DNC 132. Look it up. It gets every child with an adult they can trust whose job it is to ask questions and report abuse every three months. This will almost completely stop child abuse immediately. Child abuse is the most commonly cited predictor of serious mental illness in later life. Preventing the predictor might not fix the problem, but it makes it a lot less severe. Additionally, it will significantly increase early detection and treatment of mental illness. As the mentally ill are significantly overrepresented among violent criminals, this will significantly reduce violent crimes within one generation. Our society is broken and we need to start fixing it. This is my idea and this video is my commercial. Thank you for watching. Why not help spread the message and share it? Even if you share it to an Instagram account with two followers, if you use the share button, YouTube sees that and shows the thumbnail to more people. Thank you again for watching. Till next time, lock your doors. Unless you're sure the next door neighbor didn't need unreceived mental health attention as a child. Also, if you let the credits roll while you go potty and get a drink for your next video, the watch time will help get YouTube to push this video. Thanks. Have a great day.